Mike, good morning. Nadav, good morning. Good morning to everyone. Thank you good for morning, being here Good morning, everyone. Today. Thanks for being here. Uh, Mike, first and foremost, thank you for being here. I don't think this is your first time in Israel. I know you've been here <laughs> many times. I know you're a good friend of Israel. And uh, uh, we're, honored to, uh, we're honored to have you here, and I'm honored to have you as a partner at Team 8. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to start with something light. It's early in the morning. Uh, and this is Cyber Week, so we'll start with something light. Iran. <laughs> there you go. So, drone goes down, uh, an attack is prepared, and, you know, we're not in the community anymore, both of us, but from what we read, from what uh, uh, we've seen in the news, in the media, uh, the retaliation is going to be through cyber. So, I want to get your thoughts on two things. First of all, do you think this course of action is effective? But moreover, now being on the business side, what does it mean for us, for the enterprise, for the business? Thanks. So, uh, first of all, as Nadav said, I am no longer in the U.S. government. I don't speak for the U.S. government, and I no longer am the director of the National Security Agency or the commander of the United States Cyber Command. And I'll only comment based on what we've seen in the media. So I draw several conclusions from what I'm seeing in the media. Number one, we see cyber, which has been an ongoing part of the daily competition between nations, now clearly will be part of conflict between nations. Number two, it's interesting to see that in this case, it would appear the United States and Iran both viewed cyber as a potential response option that offered lower risk than, for example, a kinetic or a military strike. That suggests to me that you're going to continue to see more of this if we continue to view cyber as something that's less escalatory. It's not likely to trigger. It sends a message, but doesn't necessarily trigger an escalatory response from the other side. Thirdly, look at the significance of the targets the two entities chose to go after with cyber. Again, if you just read media reporting, one nation, the United States, based on media reporting, decides to use cyber as a tool to respond against military targets. Second nation, Iran, again, based on media reporting, chooses cyber as a response option to not only go after U.S. government entities, but also to go after entities in the private sector. And that would be my fourth and final point. In the West, and particularly the United States, we have always drawn this line between what is government and what is commercial or the private sector. And one of the takeaways from the activity that, again, according to the media, we're seeing, I'm not sure every nation in the world recognizes those same lines. And so for those in the private sector, just as we saw the unintended consequences of not Petya, where a nation state, in this case, Russia, executed a cyber operation against the Ukraine, which very quickly escalated and had global implications and impacted thousands of users around the world who were in no way the initial intended targets. This episode that we're seeing the Iranian response makes me wonder, increasingly, if you're in the private sector, are you going to be viewed as not just some private single business entity, but will you be viewed by some as an extension in some ways of the nation state. Hey, you represent the economic power or capability of your nation's economy, even for those companies that are large, you know, global entities. I just think this is going to be another interesting challenge for the private sector, where major companies suddenly are viewed as, if I can go after you, I can have a major impact on the economy of the nation that I'm concerned about. Thank you, Mike. So, you know, we both spent the last five days um, with a delegation of uh, CISOs, some of which have, are joined, uh, have joined us here this morning. So about 120 CISOs and CIOs uh, from some of the leading enterprise um, from around the world discussing exactly this. What are the implications? What are the implications of trade wars? What are the implications of the fact that cyber is now seen as another dimension in warfare? and how that trickles um, from nation state to the uh, business side. Based on uh, the conversations that we had over the last few days um, with uh, some of the leaders of the industry, the CISOs, the CIOs from around the world, if 
we had to address two things, right? One is, what do you see as the major up and coming threat? <clears throat> um, and let's both talk about that, and then we'll talk about the up and coming solutions to those threats. Let's start with the threat. So the threat clearly is going to get more complicated and the attack space is only growing. So if you look at the proliferation of devices, if you look at the proliferation of connectivity that is being built not into just our economic models, but our everyday life, this clearly is going to, the attack surface is growing and the potential implications for us as individuals as well as businesses and governments is only growing. You look at the power of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and some of the technologies that are, that are gonna coming down, they're both gonna offer great defensive capability and that's positive for us, but they're also gonna offer attackers a, a whole increased range of, of options. Um, the positive side for me is you see a lot more dialogue, but one of my takeaways having left the government after you know, 37 years in the US structure, uh, much of it spent in cyber and particularly in the leadership areas in cyber in my, my government, partnering with many others, many of whom are, are, are here with us for this week. One of my takeaways as I find myself in the private sector now is doing more of the same and expecting a different response is just not gonna work. And, and one of my takeaways is I don't understand why we're not using more integrated solutions between government and the private sector. When I say integrated, I mean us working together day to day. Because another takeaway for me in my previous life when I was often tasked to defend the private sector, critical infrastructure in the United States, I, I used to talk to my counterparts about, it is hard for me to defend you if the first day we interact is in the middle of a crisis. That is not a good way to learn and it's not a good way to optimize outcomes. So let's talk about trust. One thing that came in all of our discussions over the last five days is two things. One is complexity and the other is trust. Start with complexity. We, we've come to a point where our networks, our IT networks, our OT networks, the convergence of our IT and OT networks have literally become too complex for humans to understand. And if we don't understand the networks that are, we are operating on, we lose confidence. Once we lose confidence, we lose trust. And hence, cyber becomes an impediment to progress. So all these ama amazing technologies that we're seeing, hyper-connectivity, artificial intelligence, edge compute, 5G around the corner, machine learning that augments all that and creates an incredible opportunity for progress all the way from curing cancer to autonomous driving might not happen. And they might not happen because we lose confidence in our networks. When we lose confidence in our networks, we don't have the trust. And if we don't have the trust, it becomes a matter of public record. It doesn't matter if you're a part of a pilot's union, if you're the company, Everyone is told, we come together, we investigate, we then take the results of that investigation, we change pilot training around the world, we change manufacturing if it's needed, we change the techniques that the airlines use. We learn from every incident. One of the things that always frustrates me in cyber is why don't we learn from every incident? It's like we keep repeating over and over and over again, and I just think we need a different model where the pain of the one leads to the benefit of the many. And the way we're doing this now, the pain of the one, those who are penetrated, is constantly repeated over and over and over again. And the same techniques continue to generate the same positive results if you're an attacker over time. So let's talk about what's at stake, right? Um, we, as humanity, We've gone a long way. Uh, there are about 7.7 .7 billion of us roaming the earth right now. Uh, we are all connected. Uh, we have access to energy most of the time. We have access to electricity most of the time. We have an interconnected economy most of the time. And, you know, we just played this little trick on you right now by taking off the electricity to explain what might happen. Um, and. How do you like it? How did you like it? <laughs> it's a good trick. It's a good trick. 
But as, as a humanity, as a species, as a culture, as a modern civilization, you take away what we're accustomed to have, that is energy, electricity, trust between individuals, our digital information systems, we go back in time very, very, uh, very, very fast. And what we're trying to do is put together a village because we believe we have capabilities that still have not been introduced that can bring back that trust. And so I, I want to talk to you about a couple of technologies and get your thoughts about that, uh, uh, Mike. So going forward, we believe that cyber must become an enabler. All right. So uh, if, if over the last five years, we understood that uh, cyber is a big issue. Leadership must take ownership. <coughs> It's part, of, it's part of doing business. Uh, and we came up with technologies throughout uh, uh, the last uh, couple of decades that secure existing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We then moved from securing existing infrastructure um, to trying to create infrastructure that has cyber by design. And we're now thinking about cyber as an enabler to doing business. So one of the technologies that we have been discussing over the last few days is using new mathematical concepts, specifically about homomorphic Homo encryptions and others, that will allow us as a humanity, as a civilization, as an economy, to start bringing back the trust into our economy. Your thoughts on that? So clearly, I think um, it's going to be a key aspect of the future. I don't see defensive strategies um, where that's not an element. You're going to see uh, homo homomorphic. I always mispronounce it. I apologize. You're also going to see the power of quantum as that continues. So um, encryption is going to be something, I think, foundational to the future. And it, it helps us deal with the fact, so how do you secure data? And it's hard. It's designed to help us with this problem, really. Hey, how do we secure data? I don't see that changing. I think part of the problem, though, is... How do we make this much easier to use and how are we able to break processes into smaller transactions that will help us do this a lot easier, which is, I think is really going to be the benefit of this. And last question from my side. Um, 12 months after 37 years of service, you know, running some of the more complex entities on earth, first of all, what's life after look like? And second, What's next in terms of securing the, the, your nation and the world? So for me personally, hey, I actually get to sleep and I don't have to shave. So I'm, <laughs> I'm a very happy individual. Um, in terms of where is the, the future going, the technologies that we're seeing come along offer us great opportunity. I'm not one who looks at this and says, oh my God, the sky is falling, we're, you know, Quantum and other things are just going to provide attackers this tremendous advantage. Things are terrible on the defensive side. I'm a, I'm a positive individual, and I believe that technology also offers us great opportunity. But I'd make two broad comments, and then I'm going to conclude by asking you a question. The first, as you heard from uh, per Professor uh, from Ben, don't ever forget the human equation and all this. We tend to love to focus on the technical piece. But in the end, it's about motivated, well-trained, articulate men and women who understand what they're doing, whether they're simple users in using cyber as a tool in their everyday life, whether they're defenders trying to build strategies, whether they're corporate entities trying to generate economic outcomes that benefit a company and by extension a nation and the broader world around us. The human piece is so important all this, and we often tend to take it for granted. It doesn't matter what I've been doing so far in a year in business, Generally, almost invariably, the number one shortfall I hear is people, people, people. Boy, we got a great product. we got a great vision. Sales up, meeting our targets. We're in the alpha stage, the Charlie stage. We're getting the you know, generation of, of funding. But boy, we're short of, we're short of key people. So I, I really think that's going to be a huge challenge. Let me conclude by asking you a question. So you were part of this ecosystem in Israel, both in the government and now in the private sector. Over half of this audience, it looked like, came to Israel for, the, for Cyber Week from abroad. Clearly, there's something here in Israel from a cyber perspective that leads many of us to believe, boy, there is value in trying to understand it and potentially being a part of it. My question for you is, so how do you see this ecosystem here in Israel changing? As you look out over the next five years, tell me how you see this cyber ecosystem changing now that you're a part of it from a different perspective. 
Sure. So <clears throat> I think we, we are, for those of you who are here for the first time, this is a very small country. Um, for those of you who are uh, coming from uh, the United States, we're about the size of New Jersey. Um, we're surrounded by very large countries. Um, and for those of you who don't know, this is a tough neighborhood. And in a tough neighborhood, you have to find ways to protect yourself. And one of the ways that we found to protect ourselves is to leverage the fact that we have mandatory service so that we can get ahead in what we see as a learning competition. And that's what it's all about. It's not about having the best technology. It's not about having more money. It's not about having more people. It's about understanding that we're in a learning competition. Cyber is adversarial. There is what we consider the good guys and the bad guys. And if we are to prevail, it is because we will just learn faster, understand the world faster, and move faster. And so what 8200 has been able to do is not hire the people that know the most, but rather leverage the fact that we have mandatory service to predict who can learn what extremely fast. And by doing that, training the best and brightest to stand in the front lines of cybersecurity. And as an industry, we have taken these lemons and you know, we made a great lemonade. And that's why we have the density of the talent. And that's why many of you are here. And so I'm very optimistic. I think that Israel has a big part to play in this game. I think we're leveraging some of our heritage and some of our problems in order to be the, uh, at the forefront of cybersecurity. And at the end of the day, I think if we understand this is a team sport, we leverage the village that we have created, we put trust back into the system, I'm absolutely certain that we can prevail. Mike, thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Thank you all very, very much.